So a few words uh, about me. Uh, I've been working for, I'm actually working and living out of uh, Cyprus. Um, uh, and I've been working for over 20, 22 years in the Cyprus banking sector, mainly in private banking and wealth management, um, um, in, in largely in compliance uh, roles. Um, I'm now uh, with EcomBX. EcomBX is, uh, uh, is a fintech. It's an electronic money institution licensed uh, and operating out of Cyprus for the last almost uh, um, three years. I'm with EcomBX. Um, I am also the chair of the Ecom Cyprus chapter uh, since 2015 when, when we launched it in in, in Cyprus, uh, and I'm working with ACAMS on the development of, of almost all their new certifications, um, cooperating in, in things like trainings and conferences, um, also working with um, other organizations across the globe, like GCI in Australia. Um, and I'm also the vice chair of the Association of Cyprus EMIs and PIs. And I've worked with Ian actually um, um, uh, for the last two years on the 12 um, mentor mentee program. Um, even though I actually it's the first time we're interacting um, over Zoom. Um, so it is a very practical session. We'll talk a bit about uh, high risk customers. We'll talk a bit about how, um, you know, what, what high risk means uh, and how we can go about um, uh, performing our due diligence practically. It doesn't matter what industry you operate in. Um, practical, you know, due diligence is due diligence and you adapt your requirements um, on the industry. Um, so, you know, why, when writing the, the title for today's presentation, um, this, you know, knowing me, knowing you phrase came to mind. I'm not sure if anybody can tell me what the title means. I asked a couple of people at the office uh, today, but they're apparently younger than I am, so they couldn't uh, tell me where it comes from. But it actually comes from, from an ABBA song. Um, uh, and, you know, this is what due diligence is all about, really. It's about knowing our clients well. Uh, and that is how we should perceive it and how we should be able to explain it to the customers when we're asking those difficult questions. So when we sign a contract with our customers, be it in banking or um, gambling or gaming, we essentially enter into some kind of marriage. Uh, a marriage that only, uh, you know, usually only works when there are no secrets, when there is transparency, uh, and when there is a mutual understanding of, you know, what we're trying to do, what services we're trying to provide, and how the services will be provided. And we need to be equals in this relationship, which is, which is essentially based on trust. And I will start by saying that customers are good. And I will use this phrase a few times today. They're innocent until proven otherwise, because sometimes we actually get carried away and we treat them as being guilty and even asking, you know, asking them to convince us you know, how innocent they are instead. Um, with that said, let me jump into uh, today's objectives. We'll talk a bit about what defines a customer as, uh, as high risk. We'll talk a bit about uh, complex corporate structures and other types of, of high risk customers, um, uh, including uh, legal arrangements. We'll talk a bit about shell companies and also um, obviously practical um, enhanced due diligence for building a, a, a useful customer profile. Again, please free to, to jump in using the chat um, you know, with any questions or comments. Um, you might have. So I have a question for you. What is a high-risk customer? And obviously a high-risk customer is a customer that um, poses higher than average risk for money laundering or financing of terrorism. But should we actually avoid these customers? You know, a lot of times when you talk to people um, in financial institutions or other sort of industries, they, they say, you know, we have a, a great policy on customer acceptance. We simply avoid, you know, the higher risk customers. And there's been a lot of, you know, discussion and, and talk about de-risking across, uh, you know, across the world uh, on, on various uh, types of industries, uh, various types of, um, uh, of businesses, including in some cases, casinos or, um, or gaming. And actually the truth here, I mean, the answer to this question, in my opinion, is that it depends. It depends on the level of risk. It depends on your own risk appetite, which is driven by your ability to manage the risk. And it depends on the risk appetite of your institution, which reflects on that ability to understand the risks that your customers are, are probably posing to the organization and to what extent you have adequate controls in place to be in, in a position to mitigate the risk and allow good businesses uh, or good business to go through. Because essentially that's why we're here. We're here to allow good business to go through. 
to go through. And remember, clients are good and we want and we need the good clients to use our products, to use our services so that we can carry on doing our business and we can carry on bringing food to the table for ourselves and our families. So your clients, your client base, all the people who, who use the products and services that you offer, um, basically anyone who wants to establish a relationship with a financial institution can be a client, but financial institutions obviously do not want every client. Uh, casinos do not want every single client. They want the good clients. So those clients which will be within the risk appetite of the financial institution. And to get there, we need to apply a risk-based approach on how to handle those clients. And that would be your customer risk assessment methodology that will help you risk rate the clients and define which clients pose a low risk, which clients pose a medium risk, which clients pose a high risk, or which clients are prohibited in terms of how ready you are to take on the risk they bring with them. And this means basically two things. First, you need to know your customer. And second, you need to know um, the risk associated with this customer. So who are your clients? Are they individuals? Are they legal entities? Uh, if you're working for a financial institution, are they financial institutions themselves? And all of this is important to consider within a risk assessment. So normal retail clients, um, um, you know, individuals who want a basic day-to-day uh, -day account from a financial institution could perhaps pose a lower risk than foreign high net worth individuals. And it's the same, again, across every, uh, every industry. Um, and again, if, if you're working for a financial institution, if you're looking at multinational publicly traded corporations, they usually have a lower risk than private companies because there is transparency and there is much more publicly available information and due diligence is easier for a corporation listed in a major stock exchange. You know, a few years back when I was doing my, uh, my CAMS exam, and now it seems like a, a long time ago. Um, I was working for, for a bank, right? But I was sort of forced to read about all the different industries. And I, you know, I wouldn't get a lot of things out of that, um, uh, you know, out, out of the training, out of that discussion, out of that uh, study guide. But then I realized that the more you know about how risk is defined across the different industries, the easier it is for you to understand how risk is mitigated in your industry because you deal with a lot of people, right? You, you don't just deal with your own industry, you live with people, you, you deal with people wherever, uh, whichever industry you're working in, you deal with people from across uh, different uh, practices or, or industries. So going back to our risk assessment, by conducting a careful risk assessment on your clients, you consider things like the very nature of the customer, um, like who the customer is, how is the customer structured, is the customer an individual or a legal entity, uh, the, the type of legal entity or legal arrangement, you know, what is the industry the customer operates in, the source of funds of the customer, um, things like um, the customer's background, but also the risks that come with the jurisdiction the customer is registered, uh, located, or born in, or, or operating, or does business with. We look at the product or the service the customer intends to use and take into account the vulnerabilities of that product to misuse, and also take into account how the customer will interact with us and how the product is delivered to the customer and how the customer came to us. So if you are operating a land-based casino, you have different risks to face than if you're operating an online um, gaming or, or gambling business. And again, it, it, things like reliance on third parties, for example. And we look at some of this as we move along uh, the presentation. So examples of, of some high-risk um, situations. We'll look at some of these today. Um, you know, pets, um, uh, politically exposed persons. We'll look at, you know, how this um, can bring about a bit of, of risk. Um, uh, private banking, uh, if you're working for um, a financial institution or if you are dealing with customers that have, uh, that are um, um, enjoying, you know, private banking services. Shell companies, um, that's a, that's, there's been a very big discussion across the world, but mainly in Europe about this uh, and Cyprus, actually, where I come from, did a lot of things uh, from the regulatory perspective to deal with shell companies. Um, you know, it, it's a bit rigid. Uh, it's a rigid approach, but it, it, it sort of works. Uh, complex structures, legal arrangements, and we talk about trust and foundations, um, different jurisdictions, including tax havens or secrecy jurisdictions. And, and this is what I meant before by you know, knowing the country risk, where your customer is exposed, where you are exposed, 
um, and 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 you know where the customers the, uh, customers your customers are dealing with which restrictions um, or where their customers are perhaps. Um, talking about pool of client accounts or omnibus accounts, but also other high risk uh, situations could be uh, gaming or or, or gambling um, uh, you know businesses and. You know, if you're working in a in an industry, for example, if you're working in a, a gaming um, um, business, it's really important to understand how you are perceived uh, from the from the outside, right? So, I'm working for a financial institution. A lot of times, when we're dealing with um, correspondent banks, for example, who perform transactions on behalf of our customers, they sometimes avoid specific industries because of the risks those industries pose. Um, uh, and also their ability or our ability to, to manage those risks. So a lot of times we might think that, you know, our business is risk-free or is low risk because we're actually working in that industry, but it's really important to manage the business well. It's really important to understand how the business is perceived uh, from the outside. I don't see any comments or questions so far, so I'm moving on. Um, talking a bit about, about pets and you know, what are PEPs? And again, that affects um, a lot of different industries. Um, a, a PEP is essentially somebody, a natural person who's been entrusted um, a government position, a prominent public function, like a head of state, a president or um, prime minister, um, you know, ministers, deputy assistant ministers, uh, members of parliament uh, or similar legislative bodies. I'm, I'm taking this definition from the European regulation, but obviously very similar definition applies across uh, the globe. Um, members of governing bodies of political parties, members of Supreme Courts. Uh, in Cyprus, we include mayors. In other countries, you don't include things like mayors, but we've had our share of scandals uh, with, with mayors involved in, in corruption um, um, uh, cases. Um, so we decided to include this as well in our definition. Uh, some countries um, uh, only apply the PEP definition on foreign PEPs. Uh, across Europe, uh, we apply the same definition um, uh, when talking about PEPs uh, wherever they are. I mean, if they are PEPs within the country, domestic PEPs, we treat them exactly the same way as we would treat um, um, a foreign um, or um, a PEP who is based or has the public function somewhere else. And the definition of, of, of the PEP does not uh, just you know, stay with the PEP himself or herself, but extends to uh, family members, uh, extends to um, uh, you know, the, the, the spouse, the wife, uh, or the husband, uh, uh, or um, uh, the, uh, you know, any relationship that the PEP might have, uh, children, um, or and, and their spouses as well, parents of a pep, but also close associates, associates, which is very interesting because it's a lot of times it's very difficult to identify who those close associates are. And you might find a lot of information going online, uh, but usually close associates are defined as those natural persons who are known to have a close relationship, a close uh, business relationship, or even a personal relationship um, with, um, uh, with a pep. Um, um, and again, it is a very difficult thing to, um, uh, to pinpoint. Um, you can find it uh, by um, looking at the businesses that PEP um, is involved in, um, the legal entities that PEP is part of, but also um, uh, you know, going online and, and doing a bit of search, um, you can uh, sort of come down to a conclusion as to whether there is um, a relationship there, business or otherwise. Um, and actually, it's up to up to you. Uh, the definition of a PEP can extend to things like, um, even, even if, you know, strictly speaking, according to regulation, especially in the, in the EU, a PEP ceases to be seen as a PEP if they don't have um, this public function for over 12 months. It's actually up to your own risk appetite and your own policies how to define um, the PEP uh, in terms of, you know, does this person still have political power? Does this person still have involvement with the uh, with the government? Um, and and there you can decide to treat the customer as a PEP and treat the customer as as being of high risk. But you know where where is the risk there? I mean, why are we bothered? Why do we care about PEPs? 
PEPs usually have access to public funds and PEPs, because of their position and because of their power, they can be made vulnerable to, to corruption and, and other crimes. There was a case in Cyprus a few years ago, uh, believe it or not, with the, with the Cyprus sewerage system, um, with, the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the sewerage system in a, specific, uh, in a specific city where the mayor was involved in a corruption scandal by taking uh, kickbacks from, from giving this big um, a contract for the sewage system to, um, to, a, to a company. Um, and when he received a kickback, I mean, the, the, the first thing he was asked was, why did you do this? Why did you receive uh, you know, this, this uh, money from the company uh, to which you have granted you know, this, this contract? And the response was very pure and sort of innocent, you know, because I needed money to build my, my daughter uh, uh, a home. So a lot of times they are caught up in this um, sort of vulnerability or this, this position where they do have the access to public money and they can take advantage of that, of, of that power. So we're talking about things like corruption, fraud, money laundering, tax evasion, abuse, obviously abuse of their power, uh, greed, um, and, and so on and so forth. Another thing we, we scratched upon uh, at the beginning was complex structures. Another high-risk um, um, area. Um, and you know, if you're dealing with, with a company um, or with a legal entity that's involved in a complex structure um, that is set up in a, in a uh, sort of a, a more complex type of, uh, of situation, um, first of all, you need to define what you mean when you say complex structure in your own institution, right? It could be a three-layer structure with uh, legal persons, with legal different types of legal entities. It could, it could be a three or four layer structure with, uh, you know, from involving multiple jurisdictions, involving tax havens. It could be um, a, a simpler structure involving legal arrangements for other types of, um, of entities. So one of the things you should ask is why is it set up this way? I mean, I've seen when I was working for private banking um, a few years ago, I would see a lot of, of my customers who were um, uh, obviously natural persons, they would set up their structures in such a way, um, in such a complex way, and it was really difficult to come down to the actual ultimate beneficial owner, but also understand why is the structure set up this way. There could be a great reason why you would have a complex structure. For example, airline companies, they set up structures where they, um, uh, they set up different companies to um, hold ownership of the different airplanes they have. The same with um, uh, ship management companies or companies that own different kinds of, um, of, of vessels around the world. They would set up different structures across, across different jurisdictions to hold ownership of those, of those vessels. And that makes it easy uh, to, to sell them or to, to manage them. But again, you should ask why is the structure set up this way and does it actually make sense? Um, who is really in control of the activities of, of the customer? Um, how will money flow through the, the structure and interaction of the parties involved uh, in the structure and the rationale behind using that structure to deal with you and to deal with your own products and services? So if you have, um, um, uh, if you're facing a legal entity um, uh, customer uh, who is involved in this sort of uh, complex um, structure, you need to establish and be clear about who controls the structure, how the money flows, and uh, be in a position to monitor if things change across um, the course of the relationship. A lot of times we talk about UBOs, right? And, and, and it's, it might seem weird, but it is a new concept in some jurisdictions across the world um, who were really um, um, a lot of times relying on, on, on the shareholders. But the shareholder, a lot of times, might be a nominee shareholder, so not the actual the, the person who actually ultimately controls or owns uh, the, the legal entity customer. So a UBO, the ultimate beneficial owner, is that natural person or those natural persons that ultimately own or control the customer uh, and whose, uh, on whose behalf a transaction is being conducted. So um, whenever you deal with a legal entity or a legal arrangement, you need to drill down to the actual UBO and find out who actually controls the customer and whose benefit uh, any transactions or any dealings um, will, be, will be made. 
So if we look at these examples here, right? We've got two, um, two structures. You could say that um, they might be complex structures. They have more than three layers of ownership. Um, and the presumption here is that the UBO is at 25% as per um, you know, the EU directives, but also as the, you know, it's, 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 it's a global norm uh, to treat um, um, UBOs as those persons own in, o, owing or controlling more than 25%. In this case, the calculation of the beneficial owners will be in accordance with the, you know, to the presumption of 25%. So if you look at the first, um, the first structure on the left, um, George directly owns 25% of hotel AS, which is uh, our customer in this case, and is therefore a beneficial owner. Um, Paul directly owns 9.69%, um, which is essentially the 19% times the 51%, um, uh, and um, therefore is not a beneficial owner because he holds less than 25%. Charlie directly owns 15% and indirectly owns 13.24% um, more. If you do the calculation again, it's um, 80 percent um, times 30 percent times 51 percent, which brings you to 13.24 plus the direct 15 percent. Uh, that's a total of 28 percent, 0.24. So therefore, Charlie should be treated as a UBO. If you look at Suzanne, she owns 3 percent of Hotel AS and is therefore not um, a beneficial owner. Rachel indirectly owns 13.27%, right? And is therefore not a beneficial owner. However, you should consider that uh, Rachel has controlling interest in all the companies uh, with 51%. So, so you should consider where... Excuse me? Does anybody have a question? No, maybe accidental unmuting. Um, so where was I? Um, if, if we look at the second structure, right? Um, the second structure, individual X that you see um, um, in the structure. Give me a second. Individual G, I'm sorry. Individual G that you see in the structure. Now, individual G is a beneficial owner, obviously, because they hold 80% of, of the units in, in trust, in C trust, um, uh, which in turn owns 80% of, of our customer, um, of APTY, which in turn holds 50% of, of PTY limited. This is simple math. It gets complicated because we've put a lot of, of structures on the way, but you, you see where I'm going with this, right? You always have to drill down to see, you know, each specific person, um, what sort of ownership they have and how to treat these persons in the structure, essentially looking for uh, the beneficial owner. Um, I know it's, it's a long presentation, um, but I, I was intending to play a game here. And I was intending to ask you to tell me, looking at this sort of structure, who should we treat as a beneficial owner? Because I think despite the time we're we are giving to this, um, to this specific section of the presentation, I think this might be the most important part of the presentation, you know, who owns and who controls um, our, our customer. Would anybody want to give it a go? I can give you a couple of, of minutes. If I don't get a response, then I will do it for you. We're looking for one person out of the whole structure. Any ideas? Excellent, I got my first response.
So actually, it's not one person. It's more than one person. Excellent. Okay, let's let's resolve this puzzle. So if we look at these people one by one, right, starting from the left and going to to the right of the screen, Mr. Z owns twenty eight percent through companies E and B, right? Mrs. X owns six plus six point twenty five. If you do the math, um, so uh, twelve point twenty five percent through companies E and B and G and C. Mr. Uh, Mr. Y exactly the same um, situation, uh, holding 12.25%. Mr. X, again, 12.25% through companies F and C. Mr. V owns 12.25% through companies H and D and M, K, J and D. Mr. W, 15.75 through companies H and D. And Miss, uh, Mrs. Um, y um, owns um, 7% through companies L, K, J, and D. So looking at the, at the structure here, it's noticeable, it's notable that it is quite complicated by um, the fact that X, Y, and V exercise beneficial ownership of company A through multiple uh, routes. And this emphasizes you know, the importance of identifying all the natural persons in a corporate structure, even if verifying the identity might not be required in all the cases under a risk-based approach. In a, in a scenario where a firm uses a verification or identity threshold of 25% for beneficial ownership, actually only Mr. Z would require his identity to be, to be verified because he's the only one holding 28%. But it is a complicated structure. It is a complicated structure because again, some people exercise uh, ownership through multiple, multiple routes in this structure. Um, so, uh, you know, despite saying that, though, and uh, despite the threshold, the management of risk should not just be based on the planned use of, of these numerical thresholds, but rather it should be based on analysis and understanding of the circumstances. And this is where enhanced due diligence comes, comes in. Very quickly, uh, a few words about shell companies. You know, shell companies have been discussed widely across the globe because of the, the, the ability of um, of, of criminals to hide behind shell companies. Um, it is uh, especially, um, they, they are quite popular in the sense that they're not all, all bad. A lot of times shell companies are used for, for things like holding uh, assets or holding uh, pieces of art um, uh, or um, uh, in investments uh, or M&A deals. Uh, but essentially what a shell company means is a company with no physical presence uh, with no operations, with no essentially, uh, with no economic activity or no reason to exist, uh, if I can use that phrase. In, in Cyprus, we have used a, a stricter definition for shell companies, exactly because of all the issues we had in the country. Uh, it's not bad to, to, um, uh, to accept the fact that you've had issues because that's the only way to, uh, to improve yourself. Uh, in the legislation, we have a stricter um, definition of shell companies which um, includes the fact that you know, a shell company is a company with no physical presence or operation in the country of the corporation. Um, and, and that means uh, management and control uh, and no established economic activity in the country of the corporation um, or, um, um, and obviously no documentary proof to the contrary. Uh, and economic activity can also mean holding stocks of shares. It can mean holding assets. Uh, it can mean um, facilitating specific deals, trades, or, or asset management, uh, and essentially legitimate business. So when we talk about economic activity or the absence of economic activity, we mean the absence of a documented legitimate uh, business. It's a bit stricter because it only talks about the country of corporation. Um, um, you know, a, a more widely accepted definition of shell companies um, would include um, uh, those companies that don't have a physical presence or a place of operation or real economic activity anywhere uh, in the world, you know, irrespective of the country of incorporation. Um, uh, that's why I said it, it is a bit, uh, a bit strict. Uh, and, and the Cyprus regulator goes further to say that if you have um, either um, of the two elements of that definition that we've seen in the previous um, slide, um, then um, you should avoid um, or terminate any relationship with that um, uh, company 
if it's registered in a, in a jurisdiction where there is no um, requirement to file uh, audited financial statements and the company does not voluntarily uh, prepare those financial statements or the company is registered in, in a, a jurisdiction that is defined as being non-cooperative by the EU or the OECD or another um, uh, global uh, body. Talking a bit about, about trusts, um, now it is important to define trust. It's important to define who is the beneficial owner in, in trust, and that is part of our uh, due diligence or enhanced due diligence process. When we're talking about trusts, uh, we're talking about um, 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 a legal, um, uh, it, it's not a legal entity, but it's, it's some sort of arrangement where you have a settlor, the person who actually holds the assets, who puts the, the assets in trust um, with a trustee. Um, and the trust deed, the document that controls how uh, the trust is governed, um, sort of um, has the rules of how that, uh, that property will be managed by the trustee. So the trustee is essentially the legal owner of the trust, but the settlor is actually the person who has provided the assets uh, to the trust. And the trust can have specific beneficiaries. Um, uh, and all these, um, uh, if we're talking about identifying the UBO, all these people need to be, uh, be identified because they all have uh, a part to play or a role to play in, in how the trust is uh, set up and managed. So you would need to know, you know who the settlor is and where they got the property from. Um, uh, so if you're performing your enhanced due diligence, you would need to uh, go back and find out things like source of funds, source of wealth, um, and, and all that has to make sense. Um, the trustee obviously has the legal ownership of the of the funds or the assets, so they should also be identified. Then you have the beneficiaries who could be, you know, um, anybody actually that will be a beneficiary of, of, of the property at some point. And in cases where the fund has a protector, um, uh, and the protector is essentially somebody who has control over um, the, tr the trustee or not the decisions of the trustee, then you should also need to uh, identify and verify the protector because they basically have um, uh, control um, over um, the, the trust as well. A lot of reasons why we should we can set up a, a trust, um, uh, you know, for things like tax planning, asset protection, co-ownership, succession planning, uh, and so on. Uh, and there are obviously risks um, because trusts have been used uh, um, traditionally to um, to hide the, the actual beneficial owners. They can be used as a, um, a tax evasion uh, vehicle in, in specific circumstances. Um, um, and, and a lot of other um, um, opportunities for um, uh, misuse. I think I'll skip a few slides in the interest of time. I see that we are sort of running out of time and I still have a lot of things to, to say. Uh, but, uh, you know, I wanted to emphasize here that in things like trusts and also foundations, what is very, very important is to identify the parties that have uh, control over the trust, have, have control over the foundation, and who are also beneficiaries of, um, uh, of, 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 of the assets or, or the proceeds from these um, legal arrangements. Okay, just a few words about foundations. One of the differences between foundations and trusts is that foundations are indeed uh, legal entities uh, comparable to, to, to companies, whereas trusts are not legal entities, they're um, legal arrangements. Uh, they don't have um, um, a defined legal, um, a legal status. And, you know, it's, it's really difficult to find um, a definition of a foundation. I, I actually um, uh, was struggling when I was doing a presentation a few years ago to find a proper definition of a foundation. It is described, though, in an earlier FADAF uh, paper um, as, um, uh, um, you know, requiring property for a specific purpose uh, and um, a legal entity that can also engage in, uh, in, in specific businesses. There is control over what the foundation does in terms of uh, a specific board of directors, um, and it doesn't have owners, but it actually has 
um, beneficial. In, in, a, in a lot of jurisdictions, they are also um, quite uh, regulated. They are created for, um, um, you know, um, succession planning or, or for, for, you know, as a will uh, to manage or administer uh, distribution of money and family property across different uh, persons, but also uh, to hold um, um, ownership of, of different assets like uh, even legal entities. It has a specific document, which is called, you know, in, in comparison with the trust, which has a trust deed, here we have the charter and bylaws, which does essentially govern how um, a foundation is run, how the foundation is structured, and what the foundation can actually um, do, including, um, um, you know, the founders, the protectors, the beneficiaries, uh, and so on and so forth. And again, a beneficiary here, um, of, of um, a foundation, of a private foundation, is somebody who is either identifiable by name um, or um, by reference to, to a class. So if we're talking about, for example, a charitable foundation, there could be reference to a specific class of, uh, of beneficiaries um, who are entitled to benefit uh, under uh, the foundation, under the, the, the charter or, or bylaws uh, of the foundation. Again, why am I going into all this is because when you're dealing with these sort of arrangements in a complex structure, again, we, you need to drill down to understand exactly who's controlling, who is benefiting, and, and who has um, ownership of, um, of, of the structure. So it's important to, if you're working, for example, in, in, in an industry that deals with these um, um, uh, st structures and arrangements uh, on, a, on a daily basis, it's really important to understand them well and to have proper guidance for your colleagues in the front line to be able to analyze and, and, uh, and get a, an understanding of the controls that need to be put in place uh, to avoid misuse. Um, we still have um, some time, so um, I will still... Um, uh, Ian, can we share the slides later? Yes, yes, we can. Excellent, because there's a lot of, 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 of you know, a lot of information here that um, might be of interest. So I, instead of going, um, over the, the information, uh, in the interest of time, I'll just skip a few and um, uh, talk about, uh, you know, things that are uh, most important. Excellent. So, um, again, charitable foundations um, are, um, you know, perhaps um, uh, the most, uh, of the, the ones that are of, of most concern, they can be abused for things like tax evasion, uh, tax fraud, but also for um, terrorist financing, which is a, a major issue with charitable uh, foundations and charities in general. Um, so it's, it, it is, you know, something that we should be concerned with. And that when we're performing our, our due diligence, we should uh, be, a, be in a position, again, to understand, you know, what the foundation is, why it has been set up this way, where it is registered um, uh, and, and the licensed, uh, you know, who the founder is, and obviously source of wealth uh, of the founder, um, the identity uh, of those that control um, the foundations, essentially the members of the foundations council or the foundations board, uh, understand the, the charter and bylaws, essentially like getting the memorandums and articles of association for the company in a very similar way, um, you know, receiving and understanding the charter and bylaws um, um, and, and the beneficial uh, owners, obviously, uh, if we are um, uh, talking about specific um, individuals. Um, third party reliance, a lot of times we rely on third parties to establish a business relationship with an, with an underlying customer. And uh, obviously this uh, presents a, an, an additional element of risk, uh, especially where these third parties are not regulated in a lot of jurisdictions, uh, in, a, in a number of jurisdictions across the world, you can engage with a third party who will introduce um, customers to you uh, where they are not, uh, they don't have the same responsibilities as you do in terms of, of, of AML. Um, and you know, one of the things that is and has been of concern um, uh, is, is transparency, where you have a lot of different parties involved, like lawyers or accountants or tax advisors, uh, who uh, might be uh, looking at the AML or AFC responsibilities a bit differently, differently than you are. Um, and also another risk that uh, that that is um, obvious here is uh, the, the the risk of fraud, where um, the um, these sort of professionals, the third parties, might be um, misappropriating client funds. Um, so, you know, one of the uh, things that Cyprus was um, again uh, in the spotlight for a few years ago was this over reliance on 
or on introducers on third parties, uh, especially in the financial um, institutions where um, the, the, it, it was said that they would rely on, on um, uh, third parties for the introduction of, of these customers to, to the banks, to the financial institutions, but also um, they would rely on, on the third parties for the running of the accounts, which uh, was, was obvious um, sort of over-reliance on, on the relationship. Um, and again, it depends on the controls you place um, in, in these situations. Um, for example, uh, you might decide that uh, a third party that comes uh, to, to introduce customers um, uh, to you, uh, one of the things you need to look at is their, their own AML policies, their own AML requirements, their own um, uh, file keeping uh, or record keeping requirements and, and decide how reliable they can be in terms of uh, the, uh, the KYC and, and CDD that you would need to perform on your customers or even decide to perform um, uh, your due diligence directly. Um, so a few slides on, on, on EDD. We already talked a bit uh, about it in the different types of, of, of industries and, and uh, circumstances, but essentially um, enhanced due diligence requires that we look at things a bit deeper. We look at the relationship a bit deeper. We collect more information, we understand, we get a better understanding of, uh, of, of the relationship. And um, the reason for that is because obviously the risk is, is, is higher, the more you realize, um, the more you understand about the customer, the better you are and the more equipped you are to, to service the customer. So essentially we shouldn't be looking at this as um, a burdensome task, right? Uh, if you look at a customer who is um, uh, or perhaps operates in a high-risk industry or deals with high-risk um, countries, the more you understand the customer, the better you can service the customer. So it has an, an added sort of benefit that um, the, the customer is happier at the end of the day because the service is smoother, the transactions are executed um, quicker uh, and, and, and more effectively. So essentially what we're looking for um, in, in due diligence is to get a, a good understanding of the customer, um, a, a better understanding of the customer in enhanced due diligence, so that we're in, in a position to identify abnormalities in the relationship. So the more we know about the customer, the better and the easier it is um, to define or to, to pinpoint or to pick on those, um, on those abnormalities. So what is enhanced due diligence? It applies obviously to high-risk customers, it, enhanced, it applies to high-risk products and geographies, it applies uh, to high-risk uh, delivery channels. And it involves, again, the collection of more information, the review, the, the more, um, the closer review of, 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 of the information that we collect, then the better understanding of additional data about uh, our customer. What we're trying to achieve here is to build um, a reasonable uh, client profile and ensure an understanding of the expected behavior um, uh, in, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the relationship going forward. So it includes gaining an understanding about the client's background, about the client's source of wealth, um, and obviously source of funds, and uh, also uh, enhanced and um, more closer monitoring of the relationship and the transactional um, behavior. And whenever you see changes, obviously adjusting the customer profile, depending on additional information you, you might come across um, um, in the course of the relationship. So again, essentially obtaining additional information on the customer, some more details about what the customer does, uh, volume of assets available, uh, information available through public databases, uh, looking uh, at the internet a bit more, doing some more research and updating that um, um, data, the identification data of the customer more frequently, more regularly. Uh, obtaining additional information on the intended uh, nature and, uh, of the business relationship, the counterparties that might be involved, the frequency of the transactions, um, and um, the reasons uh, for, for those uh, transactions as well. Harry's situation means getting um, an additional uh, person, a four eye, uh, to look at um, the, the relationship, approval from senior management. And this is not because senior management knows more than we do when we're performing and has due diligence, but it's because senior management should be aware of the risks that we are uh, essentially taking, uh, taking on. So obtaining approval from a senior management is really important in high risk um, situations. Um, and um, 
that would mean also at the same time a closer look at the relationship, more um, enhanced monitoring of the relationship, how the relationship changes by increasing the number and the time of the control. So essentially performing a review of the relationship more frequently that, than we would do in, um, in um, a standard CDD situation or a lower risk customer. And again, obtaining more information uh, on the source of funds and, and source of wealth. And there's a definition here um, on the source of funds. A lot of times uh, people confuse uh, these, two, um, um, these two terms, source of funds and source of wealth. Um, they have been used interchangeably in the past, wrongly, obviously. Um, but uh, it is quite simple to understand it. Source of funds is usually the origin of the specific funds that have to do with you, that have to be, that are the subject of the specific business relationship between yourselves and your customers, where the source of wealth is essentially where the customer has derived the total wealth that they have um, uh, declared. So, um, and, and also it's more important, not just to, to get information on, on the source of wealth, but it's more important to understand, you know, whether the, the source of wealth, whether the information you have in the file actually makes sense. So if somebody comes to you and says, you know, this is essentially my wealth has been derived from, um, from inheritance and I'm 20 years old and I have, uh, you know, 100 million uh, that my dad gave me, does it actually make sense? You know, and then you will need to go back and say, okay, so what was your father's uh, occupation? How did they make up, you know, all this wealth? How did they come um, uh, to 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 have this this wealth to pass on uh, pass on to you? So it's it's a lot of um, um, information, but more importantly, is understanding um, that information and and you know uh, realizing that you know whether essentially understanding whether it makes sense. Uh, so be convinced whether the funds and wealth can actually be reasonably estab established to be legitimate and perform that reasonable te reasonableness test. Does it make sense? As simple as that. And, you know, one of the things that I usually say when I'm uh, performing trainings is that, you know, we are in, a, um, in, a, in an industry, in different industries and performing, uh, you know, wherever you're working, uh, you're performing, you know, all these cumbersome compliance tasks. A lot of times you get carried away and we stop thinking, but we just do, you know, we need to use our, uh, our brain. We need to think a bit more. We need to apply critical thinking. And that is, um, um, that is really um, very important. I need to, there is somebody waiting, I think, um, Ian in the, in the lobby, but I cannot let them in. I cannot see them here. No problem. I'm just taking care of it. Thanks. Hi. Hi, Vada. How are you? I'm fine. And you? <laughs> good, good. Good to see you here. Thank you. Okay. So, um, and, and you know, a, a lot of times we, we think about these things and they, they, they appear to be, you know, really difficult collecting information from the customer. It is a legal requirement. We need to collect the source of wealth. But it's, it's easier than it sounds if we actually put it into practice. A lot of times we, we just get the information by asking the customer the specific questions. It's not, and that's, you know, going back to my first slide, I said that, you know, knowing the customer well means transparency, you know, and transparency should, should go both ways. I mean, the, the way you ask the question is really very, very important. Uh, if you tell the customer, you know, I want, the, uh, I want to find out about your source of wealth because I am suspecting you of money laundering or because, you know, I need to, I quit you of any, <laughs> of any of your crimes. Uh, it's very different to actually explain to the customer that it, this is a legal requirement. The more we know, the better we can actually uh, service the customer. So most of the information you would get by talking to the client, interviewing the client, asking the right questions uh, from the client and collecting those information, uh, those documents that the customer can, um, can, uh, can provide um, to you and also reference that um, to publicly available information to ensure that you verify that the information you are being provided with is uh, legitimate. And going forward, you can also review past transaction history and you can also review information for existing customers. And during your review, you can actually go back and say, okay, is the information that I received at the beginning still um, valid? Does it still apply? Was it, you know, looking back at the transactional uh, relationship 
again, whichever industry you're in, does it make sense? Was I given the right amount of information and the correct information? And is it still uh, consistent uh, with what I, I, I would expect from the specific customer? So um, things like um, documents are really important because I always believe in, 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 in a direct communication, in a conversation, but if you don't document it, it's like it never happened. So um, receiving some documents is really important, like things like pay slips or you know, history of employment and cross-referencing it with public information, even social media, right? Social media, they don't really, you cannot really rely on them because I can write on my LinkedIn uh, page, whatever I want, or on my Facebook page, I can, I can actually uh, write um, whatever I want, but it actually helps you either cross-reference information or it helps you uh, get some leads to other searches that we might be able uh, to do. Things like um, you know, evidence of title deeds or copies of trust deeds, uh, uh, financial statements or audited accounts, uh, letters from employers or, or, you know, or confirmations from uh, banking institutions. This is all very helpful to, um, to, to establish and to uh, confirm uh, things like source of funds and source of wealth, but also looking at public records uh, and other uh, public um, uh, information. So um, I'm sure that a lot of you, if you have been involved in, um, in, in enhanced due diligence before, you can definitely think of, of, of specific situations where uh, the information you have received uh, was insufficient. I mean, what comes to mind is uh, when I was working for a bank institution a, a lot of years ago, and we had a regulatory visit, at some point they, were, they asked to, to look at the, the, the files of, of some of uh, the bank's customers, and we provided them with this big red you know, box files full of documents. So I, I, for one customer, we had 12 or 13 different box files. It was ages ago. But when, when the regulators started looking at the information, they, re they realized that we actually had nothing in the file that was substantial. A lot of information that was immaterial. So it's not the amount of information that you collect, it's the quality of the information and how sufficient it is to help you establish and verify uh, what you're trying to achieve. Adverse media, again, it, is, it has become a regulatory um, um, responsibility and looking at things like, you know, newspapers, uh, doing some internet searches, even using specific tools or specific vendors that can help you with your adverse media search is really important because it, 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 it brings you, um, it brings in front of you a lot of information that might be um, worth looking into. Um, so um, it's really important though to either have your um, reliable tools, but um, you know know how to use them, right? So um, it's important in in um, uh, as as in everything we do, governance is really important. So having specific policies and procedures on how to search, what to search, um, you know, what data to use to search. You know, if you don't have good and clean data uh, and uh, data that has uh, that is of you know good quality, uh, then any searches you do are, are you know, hopeless or uh, to, a, to a large extent uh, useless. Um, you can do your manual search by using, you know, Google or other search engines or multiple search engines um, or, you know, things like uh, searching in, um, if you're searching, for example, for specific things in Ukraine, it would be useful to even use um, search engines that are specific to Ukraine. You will be surprised with the different type of information will come across. Obviously, it will be in a different language, but you can use a lot of, um, of, of tools to translate the information and, and make it work for you. Um, meta search engines, a lot of, there are a lot of, uh, um, of, of search engines uh, on the internet, which help you look at a lot of different search engines at the same time. And you can set up Google Alerts and also do a lot of Boolean searches by using specific words to, to, um, to perform some advanced uh, search. Um, very quickly here, uh, what I will say here is check the source, check the author, ensure that what you are, um, what you will come across is legitimate and is worth looking into. A lot of times you will come across fake news, a lot of um, uh, media that is definitely adverse, but it's not um, valid or is not uh, reliable. So look at the sources, make sure that what you are basing your decision on is quite reliable. So I have three questions that I always ask my um, uh, the, you know my colleagues uh, to or the people I 
I train to think about. You know, it's three simple things. We've talked about a lot of things today, but it's two, it's three simple things. When uh, whichever industry you work in, uh, you, you are working in, whenever you come across a client, you need to know who the customer is. So understand who the customer is. If it's an individual, if it's a legal entity, the type of structure, the type of entity. Um, if you have a pep in front of you, and so on and so forth, what the customer is doing. So. Uh, what is their profession? What industries are they involved in? Who they associate with? And at the same, the third thing and very important is what do they want from you? And does it make sense for a customer who's registered in, I don't know, Vietnam to come and work uh, and seek uh, an account or do a bit of gambling in Cyprus? Does it make sense? So what does the customer want from you is very important. We all want the business, but we do not want to be misused and understanding the purpose of the relationship is very, very uh, important. And that will define what should reasonably be expected. It will define uh, your vulnerabilities. And so it will also define your controls. Um, and, and also um, it will help you understand who is controlling um, the, the account and the decisions. Uh, so uh, I think this might be the, the last slide here. Uh, things to consider um, in a nutshell in, in enhanced due diligence. Um, you know, the, again, the customer is good until proven otherwise. Sometimes we get paranoid and we try to find ways to reject the client relationship, even if we cannot really find anything worrying, just because a client, based on the risk factors, poses higher than average risk to your institution or your industry. So what? If, if you're ready and if you have the right controls in place, you should not be afraid of the risk. Risk is to be managed and it's not to be avoided. So if you have your risk assessment um, and you understand the risk and you set up your controls like your policies and procedures and you have a right, you know, a, a culture of doing the right thing across your uh, institution, um, always try to have a story behind every single client relationship. If you're talking about high-risk customers, that is very, very important. It's, you know, we use lists and you use, you use boxes, we, we tick boxes, when we're performing our due diligence, mainly to satisfy the regulator. But the essence, the reality is that we need to understand where the customer is coming from, what they're doing and have a story in place. And that will also help guard you against the regulatory uh, visit. You know, a lot of uh, issues sometimes is, uh, they appear when we don't have enough information or when the information is a lot, but it's insufficient, uh, when it's excessive and at the end of the day is useless. And enhanced due diligence is not static. Like due diligence, it's ongoing. It's a closer look at the relationship, a closer look at the transactional activity. Uh, and again, trust your, your instincts. You know, Don't get paranoid. Customers are good. Even if they pose a high risk um, to your institution, um, um, find ways to manage it and, um, uh, and, uh, and get on with the business. I know I was rushing through it. I had a lot of things to say today. Um, but I am open if you have any questions. I'm not sure if we have time. I think we're on over time. 